Well, thank you for joining us today. And uh, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce Eric Schell, who will get us started. Thank you, Benson. Uh, good afternoon to most. Uh, good morning to some out in California and Hawaii. Um, want to thank you all for spending the next 60 minutes with us. Um, our goal as a, a panel of speakers is to have this time um, more than worth the, your investment. So um, um, background, uh, two weeks ago, um, uh, we um, gave a presentation. We gave this presentation. It was a first version. And uh, both Kevin uh, Durande from Iowa, CEO of Mahaska Health, and myself gave a presentation uh, 16 days ago. And, and it, it really information coming out of Washington, D.C., out of the CARES Act, out of other things that, that from best practices that we know you should be doing that we thought we would give a presentation. And, and that was Tuesday, two weeks ago. Uh, there was 500 people uh, that attended. Um, since then, the information hasn't slowed at all. Matter of fact, it's accelerated. And so we decided that it was time to give an update to all of the cash planning, all of the opportunities to tap into cash that you all have, as well as to hear some additional CEOs share what they're doing in response to the, the COVID experience. Um, and that's, that's the, the emphasis of this talk. Um, each of the CEO panelists, I will tell you, have one thing in common, um, other than uh, I, I know each one of them. Um, these are CEOs that when you sit down with each one of them, you feel better about yourself than when before you sat down with them. And so that I thought it would be really important to hear, have all of you hear what CEOs, you know, proactive CEOs and, and, and people, abundant minded CEOs, what they're doing to address the COVID um, pandemic. So um, that's why these, these CEOs were selected. Um, I will say that, that uh, it looks like we're four uh, guys up here. We did have a panelist, um, Leslie Marsh. Many of you know Leslie, she's the CEO of a rural hospital in central Nebraska. She was going to join, but had to drop off because her community of Lexington, Nebraska is experiencing an absolute surge right now. She spent nights in the emergency room as a firm, formerly with a nursing background. And, and, and she uh, wanted me to share um, all her best to you, but um, she's, she's very much, her community is struggling with this right now. So um, with that as an introduction to what we're gonna do, uh, do today, I'm gonna turn it over to Ashley just to introduce, or uh, introduce the speakers. Good afternoon and welcome everyone to Emergency Cash Flow Planning Update with CEO Roundtable. For today's roundtable, we are joined by Kevin Durandi, CEO of Mahaska Health Partnership in Iowa, Tony Rinaldi, Executive Vice President of Fairview Hospital in Massachusetts, and Daryl Weaver, CEO of Baptist Medical Center Leak in Mississippi. The roundtable will be moderated by Eric Schell, Stroudwater Associates Chairman of the Board. Before we get started, a few housekeeping notes. We will, we will leave time at the end for a very brief Q&A. Please use the chat feature to ask your questions. If we do not get to your question, we will email you separately. Finally, the recording and presentation will be available after the webinar. We will email all of it to you at, to the attendees by the end of the day. And with that, I'll hand it back over to Eric. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, just real briefly, I want to touch on what we're going to be covering today. Um, first, um, we're going to have each of the CEOs present on their facilities, a quick overview of their facilities. We are then going to go into an update on the cash planning that we talked about two weeks ago. Um, and then finally, we're going to move to a CEO roundtable. I will tell you on the update to cash planning, there has been so much new material. We are going to focus primarily on the new stuff but just breeze through the, the, the stuff, the, the material that we covered at the last time. So, so um, with that, I would just like to have the CEOs just introduce your, uh, their facilities and um, their system so that you can get a feel for where they're coming from and who they are. So Kevin, you wanna go first? Yes, thank you, Eric, appreciate it. Kevin Durandi, uh, CEO of Mahaska Health in Oskaloosa, Iowa. We're located in Southeast Iowa. Uh, Mahaska County is about a population of 20, a little over 22,000. 
Uh, we have about 412 employees, uh, 42 providers. And as far as uh, COVID, uh, we've uh, had nine residents in our county who have tested positive for COVID and uh, they have recovered and uh, we've treated a few of those residents. Um, so thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Mr. Rinaldi. Hi, thanks, Eric. And thanks for uh, the invite to be part of the, uh, the panel. Uh, my name is Tony Rinaldi. I'm the EVP at uh, Fairview Hospital. We are located, uh, we're a critical access hospital and we are located in the far western part of Massachusetts in the southern corner uh, in what's called uh, Southern Berkshire County. Uh, we have a catchment area of about 27,000 people. We are located geographically about two and a half hours from New York City to our south and to our east is uh, Boston about, again, two and a half hours away. Um, we, we do have, it's a 25 bed hospital. We have a census that runs around 12 or 13 patients a day. Uh, we're part of a health system, which is located about 25 miles north of us, Berkshire Health Systems. Uh, that has a 300, uh, little over a 300 bed hospital. And we were, saw our first COVID patients on February 29th in the county. And uh, we have been considered early on in the, in the pandemic as a hotspot. We are, have been fortunate to see a very nice uh, uh, flattening of the curve and uh, not to be overly uh, cautious, but it, things are looking uh, well for us. So we, uh, at Fairview, we have a census right now where we actually have five uh, COVID positive patients. So we are assisting our, our health system wow. by taking patients from them that will not be taken by our, uh, in many cases, by our long-term care facilities, uh, especially in South County. So it is uh, uh, our way of trying to help and our uh, um, staff is, is stepped up to the plate. And so it's uh, something that we're dealing with and, and doing quite Thanks. well, so thank you. Thanks, Tony. Um, and then Daryl, uh, would you just a few, few minutes on or a minute on um, Baptist League? Sure. Um, uh, it's good to be with you all today. Uh, Baptist League is uh, also a 25 bed critical access hospital uh, located in Carthage, Mississippi. We are basically in the shadow of the, the Jackson metropolitan area. We're about 45 miles uh, outside of Jackson, uh, which um, the, Jackson's the tertiary referral center for the state. So it, um, it does change our di dynamics a little bit. Our average daily census here runs about 17. We opened a, a brand new facility about five years ago, uh, which has significantly increased our census. Um, we are part of the 22 Hospital Baptist Memorial uh, Memphis system. Uh, we're one of four critical access hospitals that the system um, owns and operates. And so um, we are, uh, likewise, we're a little, uh, probably had a few more cases per capita. We're also a county of about 22,000 um, um, population. We've probably seen a few more cases uh, on per capita than the rest of the state, but our patients have by and large been uh, walking well, uh, walking, walking ill. Uh, we've only hospitalized as of today, or the, the as of yesterday, we'd only hospitalized three patients. Uh, we had transferred um, uh, two of those to our sister facility, Baptist Jackson, uh, tertiary referral center, and we've had one death in the whole county from COVID so far. Thanks, Daryl. Appreciate those comments. We're going to jump right into the cash planning because there is probably a lot more um, content, like I mentioned earlier, than we could get to in, 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 in an hour and a half. Um, so, so, so at the last time we met two weeks ago, for those of you who are on that call, um, um, we, we looked at this checklist right here of these are the opportunities that we consider are absolutely important for you as community hospitals, as, as rural health systems, to, to, to begin your planning around, you know, around your working capital. Um, everything you'll see in red is something that's changed since the last time we presented. And what we're gonna do through the, through the next probably tw uh, 20 slides is touch on each one of these areas. So, so with, with that said as an introduction, the, the first, the, the, just takes a little bit of delay here. Um, hold on. 
Okay, the first thing, we absolutely feel that this is critical and um, it's prepare a weekly cash flow projection beginning with uh, even April 1st, or, or actually begin it with March 15th when we first started seeing negative impact on our volume. Um, and, and I've actually encouraged, since our last presentation two weeks ago, I've encouraged a dozen or so CEOs. And it, almost unanimously, each one of them sleeps better when they see what happens and when they run this number. And it has to do with the, you know, all of these variables right now impacting cash. Um, I, I spoke with a, a CFO of a system uh, just now, that um, just, just an hour ago, that they were going to do a furlough. And when they ran the numbers, when they r ran the impact of some of the new um, public health safety uh, funds that came in, they backed off on their, their, their furlough. And, and it, by doing these cash flow projections, it allows you to see that. This is just an example of, um, of, of, um, of, a, of a critical a, a prototype critical access hospital that started with two and a half million dollars. It assumed volumes fell 50% starting March 15th and continued on through the entire 26 week period. Uh, the blue line is the cash from this uh, prototypical critical access hospital, assuming um, um, uh, provisions. I believe we have, we built in the SBA payroll protection program funds, the Medicare accelerated payment funds, and some other. And, and we also assumed the first wave of the PFSS, the the public health safety funds uh, coming in. What the result of this allowed a, a CEO to see was that that. Beginning the, the period, they had two and a half million dollars of cash. By the end of 26 weeks, they were down. They were up to seven million dollars, um, with volumes down 50 percent. There's an Excel spreadsheet that we built here at Stroudwater. It's the it's referenced right there. If you just if if you just click on that link, it's there. You can take it. It it literally will take you 30 minutes, and you can do your own uh, financial projections. So I highly, if you haven't done it, do something like this. Uh, in terms of accelerated payments, there really hasn't been any change. Most people that we're going to tap into this have tapped into this. This is the opportunity that, Medic, uh, that, that CMS came out and said you can it, uh, request it accelerated um, Medicare payments um, for PPS hospitals. That's 100% of, of historical Medicare payment for a three-month period. For critical access hospitals, it's looking back at a six-month period ending December 31st, and it's 125% of that. Um, so, so um, there is a repayment. You have to begin repaying 120 days past receipt. Um, and if you don't pay it off um, after a year plus a 30 day notification period, the interest rate is steep at 10.25%. The next, and this is, this is um, gosh, I, I, I left my office yesterday about 10 minutes to five. And, and by the time I got home and got an exercise in and came upstairs, I had 20 emails because uh, most of you had received notice that the new Public Health and Social Services Emergency Grant Fund um, came out with some new provisions. Um, NRHAs work tirelessly to, um, to, 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 to have us, us you know, in, in rural and community hospitals be recognized in Washington, D.C., and that effort seemed to have paid off. So the first comment is to recognize receipt of the dollars uh, that were received on April 10th, two weeks ago. Um, and, 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 and again, continue to prepare for the incremental costs associated with the COVID patients. Um, you know, the, the easiest way you're going to be able to support the use of these funds is through lost revenue, um, looking at revenue a year ago versus this year and, and being able to document this. The second checklist item here is that, that, that we're supposed to get a check tomorrow. Um, um, so, so, you know, recognize that, especially if you're doing a cash planning tool, that additional grant revenue is going to be coming from this, uh, from this fund. Um, and, and, and so, 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 so be ready for that. So qualifying expenses, we talked about this two weeks ago. There's a list of those qualifying expenses. Um, you can see that. And again, one of the big opportunities I look at related to these public health social services funds are the foregone revenue from canceled procedures. Um, so make sure that we're tracking that information. Here's some of the new stuff. So, so there's been 50 billion right now um, allocated from the first tranche of 100 billion dollars. 
That was before the $75 billion additional tranche that was approved by Senate on Tuesday. So for the first $100 billion, $50 billion of that is going to be distributed in two ways. The first was the $30 billion that was distributed to most of you on uh, two weeks ago, on that Friday, when we all got a nice check in our checking account. And, and that was you know, a formula that was really based on your Medicare fee-for-service receipts uh, divided by the $484 billion, which is the total Medicare payments uh, during 2019, multiplied by $30 billion. Um, and so that was that was paid out. Uh, most of it was paid out on the 10th. Some additional, another four, uh, so 26 uh, billion was paid out on the 10th. Another 4 billion was paid out on the 17th. The remaining 20 billion is going to be distributed supposedly tomorrow. And so so look for that check to come in. And it's um and it's it's this this time instead of being based on Medicare receipts. It looks like it's going to be tied to total 2018 net revenue relative to overall um, you know, health care provider net 2018 revenue multiplied by $20 billion. I mean, if that's the formula that's going to be out there, that probably makes sense um, based on the previous distribution. But, but definitely plan on an amount that should show up tomorrow um, that is your share of this $20 billion. The next slide as it comes up here. Oh boy. So, so in, in the memorandum that came out yesterday, uh, there was also targeted allocations. And, and in, so, so again, there's a hundred billion total in the first round of the public health safety funds, of which 50 billion were the, the 30 billion and the 20 billion. There are additional allocations. Um, there was a 10 billion allocated to hospitals that were experiencing, you know, significant impact related to COVID patients. Um, and 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 what um, um, uh, CMS is looking or HHS is looking for is is your total number of ICU beds and and admissions related to COVID. There's also an allocation for the treatment of the uninsured at Medicare payment rates, and that's going to be determined. And then the big win for many of us in rural was 10 billion allocated to rural hospitals and clinics, and um, um, you know based on operating expenses. And, and I had had some people say, well, how are you going to determine operating expenses? I would assume it's going to be tied to your cost report. But but again, the the, the guidance that came out in the four-page um, memorandum from HHS yesterday was just it was going to be based on operating expenses. So if you think about it, if there's uh, you know, 2,000 rural hospitals, uh, $10 billion, um, that's about $4 million um, per hospital on average that we should be receiving um, as early as next week. Uh, there are strings attached um, that, that, that within 30 days of the receipt of these funds, we're going to have to sign an attestation concert, confirming receipt and promise not to bill the surprise um, out-of-pocket payments, surprise um, billings. And then, and then um, 10 days after the end of each quarter, recipients are going to uh, that receive more than 150,000 um, are to submit some information related to that. And all that information, total amounts received, amount of funds expended, and then a detailed list of all projects or activities. So there is going to be some strings, but I mean, uh, clearly, in my opinion, uh, the, you know, the, the strings attached are, are worth are 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 are, are definitely worth it. Uh, the next program that we're going to just touch base on, and this is for all of those that are are a ship eligible hospital, which is the small rural hospital improvement program. Historically, we've received annual grant amounts anywhere from seven thousand to twelve thousand dollars on this program. Uh, this program, uh, the, the, just the the, the the guidance on this just came out yesterday, um, and 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 individual hospitals are going to be granted anywhere between seventy-one thousand and eighty-four thousand, depending on the indirect awards within their 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 state and how that the funds are distributed. Um, so the hospitals are not going to have to fill out a grant for these. Um, um, and, you know, and the intent of these dollars is to be broad and covers COVID-related activities including, and I, I quoted this from the correspondence, responding to the increased need for testing, clinical services, equipment to meet the needs of the community, as well as to address financial and workforce challenges related to the impact of COVID-19. Um, so, so, uh, so,
so so that's that's the the money so you're going to be receiving this money the states just got notice of the the reimbursement yesterday and and i would think within two to four weeks we're going to be getting these funds so in terms of your cash planning document you can build that into your cash planning document did we lose kevin yeah he'll be back shortly okay um the next is the boy we've had all kinds of uh discussion on this the small business, uh, the SBA payroll protection program. Um, this was the funds that 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 um, we we talked quite a bit the last time. The good news is there was an additional 310 billion approved by the Senate on on Tuesday of this week. So those of you who were in line and did not get funded, you are still. It looks like you're still in line and may be funded with this additional 310 billion dollars. The money is made on a first serve first uh, uh, first come first serve basis, and um, uh, you know I think we talked a little bit about this last time. Uh, there's a huge question right now as to whether public entities, you know, government owned hospitals that meet the uh, definition otherwise are eligible for this. And I've seen attorney opinions saying no. I've seen attorney opinions saying yes. I know that there are six governmental hospital owned hospitals in the United States that have had uh, uh, payroll protection program funds deposited into their checking accounts. Um, and so there is still significant uncertainty. NRHA is, is trying to get administration to, to come up and rule definitively one way or other on this one. But it, at this point, it is, it is just unclear. I go back to the language and it says that you know, in, the, in the interim final rule that came out two weeks ago, it said um, a tax exempt um, uh, nonprofit with fewer than 500 employees or any other business, which is, is my hope that that becomes the criteria for allowing the governmental owned. Still uncertain. This is just the calculation. We talked about this last time. We're just going to we're going to move through this. Um, but it's it's um, it, it's it's two and a half times. There's a forgivable loan amount. Um, so the, the loan amount is two and a half times your average month's payroll uh, costs, and payroll costs include salary, wages, vacation, et cetera. Um, and, and, and the for, the loan that can be forgiven is uh, payroll for eight weeks, starting with the period or the, 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 the day that you receive the dollars. And, and, and it also includes interest on mortgage obligations, rents, payments on utilities. And... Um, 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 but the payroll costs have to make up at least 75% of the total amount forgiven. Some other information. Again, no changes from last time. This information is all here, and you can download this document at any time. There's, a, there's additional, for those not eligible for the Small Business Administration Payroll Protection Program, there's opportunities around payroll tax credits and deferrals. Um, the payroll tax credit has to do with uh, it's the, it's the Social Security employer Social Security taxes the 6.2 percent for 50 uh, percent up to ten thousand thousand dollars of qualified wages and there are some strings attached to that. There's also payroll the payroll tax deferrals the employer portion portion can be deferred for the period of end of March through the end of December but there were, there will be a repayment. A 50% repayment on the uh, on December 31st, 2021, and December um, 31st, 2022. FEMA, we talked about this substantially at the last time we met. Again, this information is available and downloaded, uh, and you can download it any time to, to run through this. Um, again, this goes through the excluded costs and then cost eligibility related to uh, the FEMA program. Uh, the next is the economic injury disaster loans. Um, this is this is um, um, for, for small businesses. Again, um, the the uh, the Senate bill that was passed on Tuesday provided an additional ten billion for the grants. These ten thousand dollar grants that are forgivable. And, and they also um, allowed, allowed uh, 50 billion for loans. Uh, again, this, this the first, um, um, the CARES Act provision um, dollars were used up pretty quickly on this. Uh, so in order to get the grant, you have to apply for a um, economic uh, injury disaster loan. 
the first 10,000, they, they will advance you 10,000 within three days of applying for the loan, and that $10,000 does not have to be repaid. This is a loan. Uh, it's, it's loans up to $2 million. Um, interest and principal can be deferred for up to four years. And uh, interest rate is very reasonable, 3.75 for small businesses, 2.75 for nonprofits. And the repayment terms can be up to 30 years. So again, you know, this is one of those, if we're looking through the list of all of our opportunities to improve our current cash position, there is another, this is, this is one of those opportunities. Um, um, on the 9th of April, the, the um, uh, uh, secretary announced the Main Street Lending Program, another loan provision. There's, there's three pieces of it, the Main Street New Loan, the, and then the Main Street Expanded Loan, and then the Primary Market Corporate Credit Facility. Um, you can see uh, all of the different uh, provisions of that right here. Uh, but there are fees on this. Um, the, the, uh, the, the fees are at the secured overnight financing rate plus anywhere between 250 and 400 basis points, million dollar minimum loan. And, and, and to be eligible, you have to have less than 10,000 employees and two and a half um, billion, that's, that should be a B, not an M, in annual revenues. And then just this week, um, USDA came out with guidance that, that, that ultimately said that you can request a 12 month principal and interest deferral on USDA community facilities direct loans. And uh, so again, you know, when we start looking at our liquidity and, and, and with our volumes down, you know, 50, 60%, and we start modeling out what that looks like, um, if, we, if there's an opportunity to defer our USDA loans, they just provided guidance on that. And so if anybody wants that, I, I have the memorandum from USDA. The, um, the next area is one that we talked about the last time, and it has to do with critical, especially for the critical access hospitals and interim cost reports. Um, I just, you know, I've spoken with uh, several clients on this that, that, you know, is there an opportunity to run interim cost reports, um, you know, now and then project out, you know, do a prospective cost report where you can project out reduced, significantly reduced volume and some reduced variable costs that will result in higher rates and get those rates submitted primarily so that you can get your Medicare Advantage plans caught up. Because Medicare Advantage plans, because they don't settle, you will lose revenue on this. And so any critical access hospital, I, I would highly recommend work with your cost report preparer, run an interim perspective model that you can project out what your new rates are gonna be and whatever we can do to get those rates updated, I highly recommend we do that. We talked about this 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 uh, this um, this next one. Boy, is really the the the, um, the third party payers. You know, reaching out to your third party payers. Uh, we talked about this last time. See if we can get PIP payments, um, request waivers for coinsurance, uh, copays, some other things, just just to help out here. But um, you know, obviously reaching out to them. You know, request um, you know uh, uh, um, you know the the. Um, um, extension of the filing, um, filing, uh, timely filing and appeal deadlines. It takes pressure off everybody. So that may be an opportunity. And then, and then this one is one that I didn't have, but uh, Mr. Durande from Oskaloosa, Oklahoma, or Iowa said, you know, work with your ba uh, bank to get an, expand your line of credit as a backup. And he called it the backup to the backup plan. Um, because let's just make sure that we all have enough cash to get through this. Um, other revenue opportunities. The, the only thing that's changed from the last time we spoke was that that the um, the, the FQHCs and rural health clinics are to act as distant sites. There was a memorandum that came out last Friday from CMS on 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 payment rates, and and essentially what what for for rural health clinics for any claims submitted through the end of June, they would be paid at the, um, the, the all-inclusive rate, the Medicare all-inclusive rate, but then they're gonna be reprocessed down to a $92 per visit rate. It is important to know that, 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 that any costs associated with treating patients through telehealth is gonna be excluded from the all-inclusive rate. So we have to track that time what providers are on 
and make sure we pull those costs out, out of our cost report for determining your all-inclusive rate. So if we go, if you think back to all of the checklists of the items that we talked about, there are, I, I haven't even counted them up, but there's a, one, there's a dozen items that we should all be doing to make sure that we've got the cash to get through this and, and create provisions for, for uh, you know, just to create all the provisionals that we have around making sure that we get through. Um, every single one of these may not be um, applicable to, to each of your organizations, but there's a whole bunch of them that are. Um, and like I said, starting off with that 26 week um, cash flow projection, um, Kevin, I think you did one of those. I think I sent you the spreadsheet and your CFO Gene uh, did one. And uh, it, it just helps you feel better about where you're going to be at the end of the day. That's right, so, especially so, our board. Our board appreciated the information too. Yeah. And again, it's it's uh, um, one of our one of our uh, CPA um, uh, consultants here. It's Jodwater, former CFO at a West Virginia uh, Critical Access Hospital. He spent all weekend, a couple weekends ago, developing this spreadsheet, and it's there. Take it and use it, and let it be helpful to your organization. So the next thing that we're going to do is is we're going to do a CEO roundtable, and um, what we the, the questions that we wanted to ask each of these CEOs is 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 here, and um, so what I was going to do was ask uh, each of the we're going to go through each one of these questions and have each of the three CEOs give their perspective. Uh, if we have any time at the end of this, um, I'm a little concerned because we do have a CEO from Massachusetts and they like to talk a lot. Um, is that um, gosh, he didn't even smile. Um, <laughs> have additional comments or questions you can type I believe you can type them in and Benson will be getting them so if you have a particular question of a CEO uh, type it in send it to, to our um, to our IT director and he will he will have us ask that question so with that as introduction what we're going to do is we're going to have um, because we have a southern gentleman we're going to allow him to go first Daryl um, and then we're going to have um, Kevin and then and then Tony, you can bring. Oh, actually, actually, Tony is going to go second from Massachusetts, and Kevin from Iowa is going to bring up the bring up the rear. So, uh, so, so the first question, uh, Daryl, what has been your hospital's response to COVID nineteen um, from a clinical operations perspective? I'm sure that. Um, hello again, everybody. I'm sure that. We've implemented probably a lot of the same things every facility has gone through in terms of locking down the facilities. We canceled all non-essential outpatient services. Uh, we had long discussions about what really is non-essential. The, the big one we struggled over was wound care, and we opted to continue that service because those patients will go backwards if we stop providing that. Um, so. Uh, big uh, back off in outpatient services, um, big uptick in our ability to provide telemedicine services. If you, if you had told me a month ago that we could go from very minimal telemedicine services to full-blown telemed where we have subspecialist availability, uh, we can actually do um, telemed from the nurse's station to the patient room at my facility to limit the number of times the nurses and doctors have to go or providers have to go in the room. Um, and so a big uptick in telemedicine in general, about half of our clinic visits in our rural health clinics have gone to telemedicine. Uh, so it's interesting if you go in the, the clinic today, you see all the providers sitting sort of in a row, just all responding to telemedicine, been very successful. And I never believed our local patients would have would have embraced the idea. Um, it's a it, you know we're a rural county, we're an older population. They've thoroughly enjoyed the process, um, and we could not have done that without the resources of the Baptist system. So I have to say that. Um, so we may have a few more technological resources than the typical critical access hospital. This non-system based does. Um, one other clinical thing, and this is not a commercial for this product, but we had a grant um, through our local um, rural hospital affiliation here for a product called IsoClean uh, that we implemented about four or five years ago. It's an atomized spray that you that you use when you turn over rooms. 
Um, we've had tremendous success with it. Nothing will grow in a room when you treat a room with it. It's about a 15 or 20 minute turnaround time on the room from the time you spray to when you can reopen it. And so we have triple deployed that from our, our patient room turnover to our ED and even our clinic rooms. Uh, if you have any okay. interest in that, if you'll contact me or Eric, um, I'll, I'll give you some contact information about the company. It's not very expensive. Uh, but it's a great and fetch control practice 24 seven, anytime you can use it and not really expensive. Um, our biggest challenges, and I'll stop there, uh, like everyone probably, is our access to PPE, even as part of a system. Um, we've we've begged, borrowed, and stolen PPE from everyone that we could get it from. We're in really good shape today. Um, we were able to do some direct trades as a company um, with uh, vendors all around the globe, but predominantly in China, to get direct shipment. And the other real challenge we've had as we're burning through this PPE has been to shorten the time from when we do the test to when it turns around. Because at one point we were we were waiting three and sometimes four days for a test to come back. And when you consider how much PPE you're burning just to find out a patient is negative for COVID, uh, that was killing us. But we've gotten past that. Um, I think we've gotten our test turnaround time down to a, a little more than 24 hours now. Great, thanks Daryl. Tony, you've got some words of wisdom around what you've been doing from a clinical operations perspective. Just a couple. Um, to not, not to go into exactly the same things that Daryl said, and I think if you ask this, we very much did many of the same things. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a little different approach and just tell you that what, what, one of the key things for us was communication. And I think that uh, it starts with your employees, it starts with your people. Uh, and I think we're blessed to have the individuals, both from a physician perspective and managers and, and, and all the staff that work for us here, uh, that when things like this happen, because they care about each other and they know how they contribute to our overall success, their ability to deal with these kinds of situations, they, they, the, the, the overachievement and the involvement, you don't have to encourage anybody. They step up and they do it. So uh, I've watched through a variety of different things, from the meetings that we have all day long, to activating our command center, uh, to always doing everything that we do with the patient safety coming first and our staff's uh, safety coming second. Um, we have, we have uh, uh, gone through and um, you know, our days are filled up with COVID sessions in the morning, uh, briefings, uh, briefings with the Department of Public Health during the day, our surge planning. Uh, we cover things like infection control. Everybody needed to be educated properly uh, and prepared. Uh, we go through a patient access and triage function uh, of what goes on each day. Uh, quality assurance and monitoring takes place every day. Our workforce engagement is uh, reviewed each and every day. Our communications plan with our community and uh, relations and development staff and how we're getting our communication out to our are public so they're aware of and somewhat comfortable. We all, again, I think felt the same way. Uh, our volumes went down in some cases, uh, down by 50%, 60%, and even in some cases, 70%. And one of our biggest problems now as we prepare for the future is making our community understand that we are a safe place and that our mission hasn't changed just because of COVID-19. And uh, we want to instill on them that they can come here when they have needs. Um, we, yeah, um, we'll, we'll get yeah we'll get to that recovery stage here in question number three. Yep. yep. We uh, in terms of uh, we did things in terms of prioritizing our environmental services. We were able to take various tasks away from them so they could focus on the high areas and uh, achieve uh, high infection control standards and and cleaning. And uh, that as as Daryl said, we also if we have an issue right now, it has to do with testing uh, and the ability to. to uh, I uh, get the supplies that we need. So uh, that's Thank pretty you, much Tony. it. You're welcome. Thank you, Tony. Kevin? Yeah. Clinical operations. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Uh, we set up uh, phone calls or virtual calls with our uh, physicians and providers on uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays. That included our skilled nursing facility physicians, the geriatric care providers as well. That, that whole communication piece obviously has been huge throughout the facility. Um, we did set up in-car allergy shots uh, and specimen collection out on our screening areas. 
Uh, and we also set up a COVID risk assessment exam for wellness exam uh, for the, uh, those types of patients. Uh, and also uh, we called patients to just ask how they're doing and do you have any questions? And that's been very helpful for people who, you know, patients are just fearful right now. And then the last thing is um, we created a surge emergency preparedness plan and the California Hospital Association has a really good surge plan that you can use and we can send that out after the call. Great, thanks Kevin. Yeah, let's uh, let's try to um, let's uh, try to keep our answers to a minute or so because we've got a bunch of questions and we got a bunch of questions coming in from from folks that are attending. Um, for each of you, Daryl, would you well, you know let's start with Kevin first since you got a short change on the last one. What have you done around financial sustainability? Uh, um, all right, let's move to to, to Daryl. It looks like uh, Kevin's uh, microphone has gone off. Well, so. Um we're a little bit blessed as a system in that um, we have financial resources backing us. We made a commitment as a system um, to not lay off any employees. Um, we've basically reassigned, like at my local facility, um, all the people we have to use to screen employees and um, and vendors and anyone come in the building, we move them from our from our suspended outpatient services. That's been a huge blessing for us so that we haven't had to uh, incur overtime to get those screening positions done. Um, okay. every, every program you've mentioned, Eric, we've, we've discussed with our, uh, with our corporate finance office. The other thing that I've done that's a little bit different is I probably just based on experience know more than anybody in our company about rural healthcare. So I try to be the resource for things that the, the guys that are used to running PPS hospitals wouldn't see, be sure that they are aware of these programs that are out there for the rural guys. Great, thank you. Kevin, are you back? I am. All right, do you wanna just share what you've done around financial sustainability? Yeah, so obviously, you know, we've received our Medicare Advantage prepayment, um, but uh, uh, we're also eyeing and hopefully getting that uh, part of that emergency grant fund here soon. Uh, so looking forward to that. But uh, you know, we've evaluated all the different programs, Eric, that you put together. And I think the biggest key is uh, we didn't qualify. Uh-oh, we're having trouble with your mic again, Kevin. Yeah, we lost you. Yeah. All right, T uh, T Tony, do you want to go? Sorry, yeah, Kevin. Just, just very, very briefly, we uh, obviously one of the first things we did with our, our corporate fiscal administration is we secured the appropriate lines of credit and looking to increase our liquidity. Uh, we got our Medicare uh, advance payment. And uh, in terms of a little bit of a different take, we did have, uh, we also are maintaining our staffs, but we did get our staffs to uh, really volunteer in many cases to take some paid time off and do some creative things with rotating their staffs. If they work five days a week, everybody in the department taking off one day and rotating through and some taking vacations ahead of time. So those are some of the simpler things that we try to do to try to bring expense down. Have you done a cash forecast and where you know where you're going to be going out we, 26 to 39 weeks? We did one as a as a corporate cash flow that we went through. We ran it through the end of May. So not not end at of the Fairview Hospital. And I'm yeah. sure we're going to update it now with where we think we're going. But it was done yeah. from March 1st through the end of May. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Kevin, I'm sorry. Are you back? We, we keep yeah, having sorry. trouble with that. Just keep going, Eric. Okay. Um, so, so we start to talk about. I mean, on, on um, uh, I believe it was last week we got a, a letter from HHS related to um, kind of you know, starting to move to recovery phase. So there's response and recovery. Um, and, 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 and HHS put out some criteria around when our hospitals will start thinking about phase one of recovery. Have you, th you three gentlemen, uh, you know, starting with, let's see if we can get Kevin before you go mute on us again. Um, have you done anything to talk about the recovery stage of the pandemic? We have. We started uh, already discussions about a return to work uh, and what dates 
we return to work. And uh, so we started to schedule on hold surgeries. We've got about 120 surgeries that we are waiting to uh, get back into the system. And so uh, thankfully we've uh, started those discussions with our uh, surgeons and our entire medical team uh, to get those going. Um, the clinic as well, we haven't closed our clinic yet. Uh, telehealth has taken off, but uh, we also are communicating via Facebook and YouTube to let folks know that it is safe to come to a hospital. It is safe to seek care because uh, we've seen that p folks are staying home and uh, not coming in to get the treatment that they need. And so I think it behooves all of us to get that communication out to the public. Great. Daryl? Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, we have, a uh, for the last week and a half, we have at least a half hour, usually it's about an hour call every single day talking about the recovery phase, uh, how we're yeah. gonna phase back in. Like most everybody, we have a two phase recovery. I'll just give you the quick bullet points for hours. Um, as soon as we get the go ahead from our state and corporate officials, um, we will continue admitting inpatients, but all inpatients will be admitted, will be tested uh, for COVID and assume positive until testing results. Doesn't matter what you're in for, symptomatic or not, uh, they'll be assumed to be COVID positive until we prove otherwise. Swing bed patients, we will require a, a current COVID negative result within 72 hours of admission. So we're working with our referring hospitals to get those done before the patients get here. Um, we're starting to, to reschedule tentatively, tentatively our outpatient procedures. Uh, likewise, we're requiring a negative COVID, uh, for instance, with a GI procedure, 72 hours ahead of your procedure in that window, you have to have a negative COVID done. And if you wanna come in, we'll do it for you. Uh, if you've had a provider do it, that's fine too. Um, and then for all short-term, uh, just uh, diagnostic imaging, for instance, uh, all those patients will be masked and assumed COVID positive just for simple x-rays and lab, anyone coming in the building. Great. All employees, Thank by you. the way, will be treated the same way. And we're also testing for active COVID as well as antibodies starting um, within our system in about two weeks. Great. Mr. Rinaldi? Yeah, we started a, a, a re-entry work group uh, at the system level, and we also are doing it individually down here. And uh, we have identified for all of our proceduralists in, in, at Fairview Hospital, we've reached out, we've got an inventory of all of their scheduled procedures, and we are in the process of going through and uh, actually prioritizing those by uh, using what's called, I guess, the METS uh, grading system from the American uh, Surgical Association and uh, uh, to help us be able to plan which ones should be going first. And uh, our plan is, I think we've got, it's, it's about 200 endoscopic procedures and a couple of hundred uh, different orthopedic procedures uh, that will be scheduled out over the next two to three months. We're also looking at how we make sure our facilities are appropriate because of the, the, the spacing that's gonna be required for our uh, pre and post recovery areas as well because some of the limitations we have on space. So we know we're going to actually be ramping up at probably a 40, 50, 60 percent kind of uh, demand because of uh, what we're going to try to adhere to for uh, safety for our patients and for our staff. Okay, thank you. In, in lieu of time, I'd like to jump to the last question and just in each of you have 30 seconds. Some, uh, you know, what, what have you done with your, with your hospital? That would you that you consider unique enough to and, and helpful to others that may be listening on this call, and let's go with uh, Tony. Why don't you go first on this one? We don't have you considering unique to address COVID. I, mean, I think it's really to be. Um, this happened so abruptly. I think we really needed to think about uh, what we have for resources, you know, and, and and we've gone on for a long period of time where we try to be very, very cost-effective and efficient. And I think we don't always take a look at and think about it. What, what would you do? And my emergency management preparedness people would shoot me right now because they've been saying that for a long time. You've got to be able to prepare and be ready for when something happens. And I think we found ourselves not only at the, at our, at the system level, but also at our state level and our federal level of not having the appropriate uh, resources that we need 
to be able to, to, to deal with some of these things. So I think being more prepared and having more of a, a, a plan in place, you know, we do it for various, we do a fractive shooter, we do it for a lot of different crises, but I think we could, we can learn from what we did with this. And, uh, and I think preparation to me is a, is a big piece. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Weaver. Yeah, so um, I think the one thing I've done that has we've done here that's been very interesting is we took an, an option A and option B approach uh, to our surge planning, um, realizing, as Tony mentioned, we have very limited resources here. We have no ICU beds, really very limited subspecialty coverage. We actually did a regional surge plan uh, with our, our sister tertiary hospital in Jackson that I think is very unique. And basically the plan in real short term, and somebody else may want to think about this with either with your system partner or just um, your major tertiary referral hospital, is we worked out an arrangement whereby they would take all of our uh, COVID patients, as, as many of them as they could, where, and in exchange for that, we would take their recovering COVID patients and their low acuity med surge patients they have in, uh, so that we could basically concentrate those COVID patients at our tertiary hospital. And our job is to free up beds uh, so that they can take more of those patients by our taking more of their lower acuity patients. It really is the best option for a hospital that has limited um, capabilities like we do. So that's the one thing, the one thing I'll put on the table. Awesome. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Durande? Yeah. Quickly, uh, you know, now we're in a new normal. And so uh, we're going to start implementing Saturday surgeries and evening clinics uh, after hours. People are going to try and get back to work. And so we got to accommodate our customers. Uh, we also created uh, with our local business a portable intubation box that can be placed over a patient's head while on transport in the ambulance. And that's really helped keep the aerosolization and uh, the minimize the droplets during transport. So if you're interested in that, please reach out to us. There you go, excellent. Gentlemen, I appreciate you guys' comments. Um, very interesting what, what's going on. What I wanna do is just, just you know provide these summary conclusions and they didn't change much from the last time we met two weeks ago. Um, and, and so I really just want to say we've got uncertainty out there and we continue to have the uncertainty. Um, we've dropped into this, it's almost a new normal of constant uncertainty. Um, and it, and it's, 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 I don't know about you all, but it's wearing, it's wearing me out. Um, and, and so the CARES Act has given us this opportunity to, to the extent we tap into it, it gives us an opportunity to not lose sight of our mission to our community um, as long as we know about it. And so, you know, again, I can't stress enough how much better you'll sleep if you have that 26 week cash document. Um, now is the time to be proactive. Um, um, stay informed. I mean, hopefully this document is one area where you can go where you can capture everything that we considered relevant that you could tap into to improve and, 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 and create additional financial sustainability. Hopefully, you know, if, if, if there's enough interest, we could do this again in two more weeks if enough new change has happened. But, but again, this is, you know, stay up to date on information. NRHA, AHA, others, or your state hospital associations, your state office of rural health, all they're sending out information. Stay as much, stay informed as much as possible. And, and thank you for all that you're doing out there. Um, it's, it's for me where I'm sitting in an office, uh, I can't give enough heartfelt thanks to all of you. Um, with that, um, Benson, there's been a number of questions come in. We've got about five minutes for questions. So maybe we can touch on a couple of them. Sure. The, uh, the biggest one was wanting people to speak to the preparations for swing beds and sniffs and the threats to rapid surges should COVID-19 reach them. And I think that was a question that we've covered in a number of ways, but I didn't know if anybody wanted to add about what they had done to handle that. I think, Daryl, you touched on that a little bit around swing bed patients. Yeah, um, we, we, we do an, um, an evaluation of our swing bed patients every day um, to quite honestly ask the question, in a pinch, which of them could go home? 
um, could we suspend their therapy and, and safely send them home in the event of a surge uh, that were to overwhelm our system? I think that's the most, the best thing you could do is work with your case manager to, to keep a constant check on where your swing bed patients are in the in the process. I didn't mention this earlier. Uh, our census has basically not dropped. We're still at 16 patients and very few of those are, I think I, I might have two COVIDs in house right now. So we've kept taking swing bed patients all along. Okay, thanks. Excellent. thanks. Any Anyone else wanna to add to that or is the uh, gentleman? We good? Same here, we've good. taken swing, head, swing bed patients as well, but We've also, with our local skilled nursing uh, facilities, we've put a hold on admissions for two weeks, uh, just because we've had a lot of uh, flare-ups in local towns around us. I see. Okay. And there was also a question about any clarity on whether dual status district slash 501c3 hospitals are eligible for the SBA PPP <laughs> funding. Said they're getting mixed results. Yeah, and 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 I. As as as, as I'll, I'll take that one because I've been dealing with that one now for two weeks. Um, there are, and I mentioned this earlier, there are uh, different legal opinions, one for, one against. I, I can only hope, uh, NRHA has been pressing for an answer um, from administration. Um, we tried to get something fixed in, in the law that was not, we were not, for, the NRHA was not fortunate enough to get, have that put into the um, the act that was uh, just passed through Senate this week. Um, but so so we're hoping to get some administrative clarification on the answer to that question. But at this time, like I said, six county owned hospitals in the country have received PPP checks. Um, and probably just as many have been told, or probably twice as many has been told that they, they're not eligible. Okay, and the fairly long one about the IRS guidance dated 4720 appears to indicate that qualifying entities can take a payroll tax credit in excess of employer FICA, meaning the credit can offset federal income tax. Yeah, let's hold off on that quite that, okay. that, that gets pretty detailed. Okay, way too detailed. Okay. Way too detailed. Uh, we'll get back to you on that one. Um, and then what are people... What are they doing with the fund? Some are sitting tight, but others need to cover operations. How about these hospitals? Well, so, in, in so, terms of, are they putting them directly into something, or are they are they holding them for other purposes? Uh, is the question around certain types of funds, the PPP? Is it around? Um, doesn't specify. Unclear, so maybe we need to go to a. So yeah, Kevin, I think you. Yeah. 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 Go ahead. Yeah. So the uh, advanced Medicare advanced payment funds, we are keeping that separate. And because right now we have to pay it back, we're hoping legislation comes through where we don't, but uh, we, we're not gonna spend that unless we absolutely have to. So we track two days of cash on hand, the current unrestricted cash we have, and then the cash with the advanced payment. So that's how we've been keeping it in a separate GL. Right, that, that seems to make sense. Daryl, Tony? Yeah, same thing. Yeah, okay. I, I believe our, our system is actually holding the money separate. Okay. Any other questions? And Maybe. we've got we've got a slew of them, but uh, really one last one, how testing is the crux of returning to normal. And just curious, where are you getting testing kits that will provide timely results? Any hope, insight, promises? Gentlemen? Good luck. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the interesting thing for us is the, the messages we get from Memphis, our corporate office, um, makes it sound as though they believe these tests are widely available. And so I, I call my other guy and my other buddies that run critical access hospitals and I'm like, OK, did I miss a memo? And you've got a warehouse full of tests somewhere and we don't have them. And so we're um, there's a little bit of a disconnect in all honesty between us and our corporate office in terms of how available those tests are. And also um, because our corporate office and our one of our main hospitals is in Memphis, their, turn, their turnaround time on their testing is less than a day, but it's not unusual for us to have a three day lag because of transportation, because all of our tests go there. So there's a little bit of a disconnect there in all honesty. Yeah. I think our hope, our hope is, our hope is this is so fluid that we're going to see some other kind of 
testing become available before we really start to reopen things. And hopefully that will happen and we'll be able to do a lot more testing. Our state in okay, Iowa well, did receive uh, 12 Abbott tests, uh, but it was only in certain locations in the state. So you have to send those in, but you have to meet the criteria. So it's it's evolving every day. Yeah. Well, uh, we are at, at the, the top of the hour. Again, I wanna thank the three panelists. If you ever have a chance to see, meet these three gentlemen, again, as I mentioned, they were selected because I feel that these are three gentlemen that when you sit down with them, you feel better about yourself after you're done sitting down with them than, than before you sat down. Um, and, I, and I thought that, that the story and the message that they would have would be helpful for the rest of, of, of you on the call. I wanna thank all of you for what you're doing and um, stay healthy and, 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 and let's get through this together. Thank we will. You. We will. Thank you. Gentlemen, Thank take you. care.